This is a Reconstructionist radio production. Narration by Jordan Wilson. Please visit GaryNorth.com slash free books to download this book in PDF format. Conspiracy in Philadelphia, Origins of the United States Constitution by Dr. Gary North. Publisher, Dominion Educational Ministries, Harrisonburg, Virginia. This book is dedicated to the members, living and dead, of Reformed Presbyterian Church of North America, who for over two centuries have smelled a rat in Philadelphia. Preface Quote by Daniel Drybach, 1996 One of the most striking features of the United States Constitution of 1787 is the absence of an explicit acknowledgement of the deity or the Christian religion. The invocation of a deity to authenticate or attest to divine sanction for public acts or decrees is a tradition that predates the Christian era and is found in non-Western as well as Western cultures. In this respect, the Constitution departed from the pattern of most public documents of the day. The Declaration of Causes and Necessity of Taking Up Arms, 1775, the Declaration of Independence, 1776, the Articles of Confederation, 1781, Virtually all state constitutions and other official documents are replete with claims of Christian devotion and supplication for the Supreme Being. However, the federal constitution makes no such religious affirmation or declaration, even of the perfunctory kind that was typical of other documents written by the framers. This omission is remarkable, since despite any revolutionary ardor of the time, there was little sentiment that the new republican order broke with the prevailing Christian traditions of the American people. This book is my attempt to explain this historical anomaly, a significant break in history that did not seem to be a break at the time. It still doesn't. I explain in a way that Dr. Drybuck does not. He defends the traditional view of Protestant Christians in the United States. They have believed, from 1788 onward, that the United States has been a Christian nation under its constitution. This is an odd belief on the face of it, since the United States Constitution's sole reference to God is indirect. The words, quote, the year of our Lord, referencing to 1787. If this is the sole judicial basis of the Christian American National Civil Covenant, then the case for America as a Christian civil order rests on a very weak read. The Received View Among Protestants There have been many detailed intellectual defenses of the United States as a Christian nation. These studies invariably rest on a conceptual error, equating state with nation. That the United States has been a Christian society during its post-1788 period is obvious. This is not the same thing as the United States civil order when considered in terms of its defining judicial document on which the United States rests its civil covenant. In contrast, humanistic historians turn to the U.S. Constitution and point out that it is a secular document and uniquely secular for the 18th century. They, too, confuse state with nation. They conclude that the United States is a non-Christian nation because it operates under a non-Christian civil constitution. The most detailed defense of the United States as a Christian state, as far as I'm aware, is B.F. Morris's 1864 book, Christian Life and Character of the Civil Institutions of the United States. He presented a strong case until he reached the Constitution. At that point, he not only reached, he stretched. His defense of the Union's 1861 invasion of the South concludes his argument, all in the name of Christianity. That the book did not sell well in the South after 1865 is understandable, but it did not sell well in the North either. After 1865, theological Unitarians, whose denominational peers had led the abolitionist movement, steadily took control over the political order, leaving Christian evangelicals who had served as the foot soldiers of abolitionism as the political losers, a position that their covenantal heirs retain. Morris's thesis surely did not appeal to Unitarians. Beginning at about the time of the rise of the Independent Christian Day School Movement, 1960 through 1965, there has been a growing market for Christian history textbooks that proclaim some variation of Morris's book, though without the cheerleading for the North in 1861 through 1865. One marker of this revival of interest in America as a Christian nation, at least within conservative Protestant circles, is Verna Hall's book, Christian History of the Constitution, 1960 a compilation of primary source documents. It was the first in a series of books, sometimes known as the Red Books, despite the fact that Consider and Ponder, the final volume, was published in blue. This series had a crucial defect. It never did reach the era of the Constitutional Convention, and so never got around to presenting the case for the Constitution as a Christian document. 
What is not widely known is that Miss Hall had been trained privately in colonial American history by a politically conservative Christian science teacher, Mildred LeBlond. On the title page of Christian History of the Constitution, we read that the editor was Joseph Allen Montgomery. Mr. Montgomery had been part of Miss Hall's Christian Science study group after she replaced Mrs. LeBlond. Miss Hall abandoned Christian Science before her book appeared, but there is no doubt that its origins were not in Protestantism. I first met Miss Hall at a 1963 summer conference sponsored by the Center for American Studies in Burlingame, California. The center was a spinoff of the William Volcker Fund. The conference had been organized by Rusus J. Rushduni, who was a full-time staff member at the center. The idea of America as a Christian nation received support from Rushduni's book, The Independent Republic, which was printed by the center in a spiral binding format in 1962 and in book format by Craig Press in 1964. Neither that book nor his follow-up volume, The Nature of the American System, 1965, is a systematic history. Both are collections of essays. Chapter 6 of The Nature of the American System, The Religion of Humanity, is a study of the political implications of American Unitarianism and the impact that these implications have had in American history. It begins with these words, quote, The Civil War was a triumph for the religion of humanity. Quote, he treats Unitarianism as a 19th century phenomenon. Ecclesiastically, it was. But ecclesiastically, it was always a tiny movement. It gained influence politically after 1830 in the North because most American Protestants in the North had already adopted its political conclusion regarding the necessity of a unitary state, a state that matched the Unitarian's doctrine of God. Theologically and philosophically, Unitarianism was an 18th century phenomenon with theological roots in the late 17th century, especially in the systematically concealed theology of the most influential Unitarian in Western history, Sir Isaac Newton. Chapter 5 of The Nature of the American System is Neutralism. Rush Dooney rejects the concept in principle as well as its political uses. Quote, Politicians must assure every last plundering factions of its sanctimonious neutralism while also insisting on their own. Each particular faction, of course, insists on its own impartial, neutral, and objective stance while deploring the partisan and subjective position of its adversaries. All men are equally committed to the great modern myth that such a neutrality is possible. The myth is basic to the classical liberalism and most schools of thought, conservative and radical, which are derived from it. This is a fine statement of the modern politics of self-proclaimed neutralism. What his followers, including me until the 1980s, and even Rush Juni himself did not recognize, is that this view of political neutralism produces a head-on collision with Rush Juni's arguments in his early years that the Constitution is an implicitly Christian document and in his later years as a procedurally neutral document. I argue in this book that the interpretation of the American Revolution is a, as a revolt justified by its promoters in the name of Christianity, Tom Paine and Ethan Allen, accepted, is correct, but that any interpretation of the United States Constitution as a Christian document is incorrect. I argue that the Constitution was a covenantal break with the Christian civil religion of 12 of the 13 colonies. The exception was Rhode Island. Rhode Island was the first civil order in the West to be established self-consciously on a secular foundation. That took place in 1644, when Parliament, during the English Civil War, issued a charter to Rhode Island. The colony's founder, Roger Williams, was the first self-consciously secular political theorist in the West to receive a covenanter charter for a supposedly religiously neutral civil order. The story of the Constitution is the story of Rhode Island's conquest of America. It did this without sending delegates to the convention. This has not been the conventional view of the origins of the United States Constitution. A Successful 200-Year Deception In this book, I argue that the United States Constitution is the product of 18th century Unitarianism, though not Unitarianism, which was a 19th century movement. The supposed founding fathers or framers of repute were Trinitarians in much the same way that Sir Isaac Newton had been, members of publicly confessing churches, but not personally believing the confession. John Adams and Th Thomas Jefferson were self-conscious about their rejection of Trinitarianism, as their later correspondence reveals. George Washington was less identifiably Unitarian, but he refused as an adult to take the Lord's Supper, and he avoided the use of the word Christ as systematically as Abraham Lincoln did four score and seven years later. Benjamin Franklin's religion was a religion of pract practical gentility, devoid of the disturbing concept of hell. Madison, to the extent that he wrote about religion, was self-conscious in his attempt to reduce the impact of confessions of faith and theology on politics, which he regarded as religiously neutral. In response, critics of my thesis argue along these lines. If what you say is true, 
then good Christian men who attended the Constitutional Convention were deceived by the men who called together the Convention. This is my conclusion. But this admission does not satisfy the critics. Quote, You are saying that there was a hardcore group of conspirators who actively deceived the other attendees. This is exactly what I'm saying. Quote, But how could you say this terrible thing about our Founding Fathers? On this basis, the Convention was assembled under false pretenses. All attendees took a vow of lifetime silence, they held their meetings on the second floor, no eavesdroppers, the press was barred from attending, the legislature's instructions were deliberately violated. On the final page of Jack Rocco's study of Continental, Continental Congress, an organization which committed suicide in September 1787, the author has put it as well as any historian ever has. Quote, For the most remarkable aspect of the convention's four-month inquiry, was that it was conducted in virtual absolute secrecy, uninfluenced by external pressures of any kind. No detailed instructions bound the delegates to specific goals, nor did the convention even feel constrained to confine itself to proposing mere revisions of the articles as some of its members' credentials stipulated. No crowds assembled in the streets outside to shout for the redress of grievances or to protest its decision to meet behind closed doors, except for occasional rumors, many of them inaccurate, that American newspapers published, the general public knew nothing of the convention's deliberations. End quote. If I could prove today that a group of politicians is planning to call another constitutional convention operating under the same terms that Madison Im imposed on the convention in 1787, Christians and conservatives would protest the plot vocally. They would argue that a coup d'etat was in progress. They would be correct. But the same observation can and should be made regarding the 1787 constitutional convention. This was the opinion of one of America's most influential political scientists and constitutional scholars, John W. Burgess. He was the founder of the first American graduate program in political science at Columbia University in 1880. His final book, Recent Changes in American Constitutional Theory, remains a classic defense of limited national government. Here is his assessment of the Constitutional Convention. Quote, the natural leaders of the American people were at last assembled for the purpose of deliberating upon the whole question of the American state. They closed the doors upon the idle and the crude criticism of the multitude, adopted the rule of the majority in their acts, and proceeded to reorganize the state and frame it for an entirely new central government. This was the transcendent result of their labors. It certainly was not understood by the Confederate Congress, or by the legislatures of the Commonwealths, or by the public generally, that they were to undertake any such program. It was generally supposed that they were there for the purpose simply of improving the machinery of the Confederate government and increasing somewhat its powers. There was also but one legal way for them to proceed in reorganizing the American state as the original basis of the Constitution which they were about to propose. Vis-a-vis, -vis, they must send the plan, therefore, as a preliminary proposition to the Confederate Congress, procure its adoption by that body and its recommendations by that body to the legislatures of the commonwealths, and finally secure its approval by the leg legislature of every commonwealth. The new sovereignty, thus legally established, might then be legally and constitutionally appealed to for the adoption of any plan of government which the convention might choose to approve. The convention did not, however, proceed in any such manner. What they actually did, stripped of all function and verbiage, was to assume constituent powers, ordain a constitution of government and liberty, and demand the plesibit thereon, over the heads of the existing legally organized powers. Had Julius or Napoleon committed these acts, they would have been pronounced coup d'etat. Looked at from the side of the people exercising the plebiscite, we term the movement revolution. The convention clothed its acts and assumption in more moderate language than I have used, and professed to follow a more legal course than I have indicated. End of quote. Burgess went on to observe that the public in 1787 did not understand what was going on. Of course, the mass of the people were not at all able to analyze the real character of this procedure. This is still true today. The primary victims of the convention, Bible-believing Christians, come to the defense of the Constitution whenever they believe it is under attack. What happened at Philadelphia? A coup. Burgess continues, quote, Really, however, it deprived the Congress and the legislatures of all freedom of action by invoking the plebiscite. It thus placed those bodies under the necessity of affronting the source of their own existence unless they yielded unconditionally to the demands of the convention. End of quote. The convention's proposal of a plebiscite proved to be politically irresistible. 
Congress refused to challenge the convention's deliberate overturning of Congress's own authority and also the rules governing the amending process that were specified in the Articles of Confederation. Instead, on September 28, 1787, Congress passed along copies of the proposed Constitution to the state legislatures, which in turn authorized the calling of state ratification conventions that would be completely independent of the legislatures, thereby transferring sovereignty to the state conventions. Thus did Congress and the state legislatures allow the better organized Federalists to replace the existing national Constitution in the name of the people. But to do this, they needed justification. The conspirators in Philadelphia, and above all, George Washington, provided them with this justification. He was the main source of the conspiracy's legitimacy. In 1916, a two-volume biography of Chief Justice John Marshall was published. It was written by Senator Albert Beveridge. Two more volumes followed in 1999. Senator Beveridge agreed with Burgess, whom he quoted briefly. I wish that every American high school student would read this paragraph and think about its implications. I wish my critics would too. Quote, the general federal convention that framed the Constitution at Philadelphia was a secret body, and the greatest pains were taken that no part of its proceedings should get to the public until the Constitution itself was reported to Congress. The journals were confided to the care of Washington and were not made public until many years after our present government was established. The framers of the Constitution ignored the purposes for which they were delegated. They acted without any authority whatever, and the document, which the warring factions finally evolved from their quarrels and dissensions, was revolutionary. This capital fact requires iteration. For it is essential to an understanding of the desperate struggle to secure the ratification of that then unpopular instrument." End of quote. This is not the prevailing view of the Constitution in the textbooks. It is rarely mentioned in, spe- in specialized academic monographs on the Constitution. The historians have accepted the m- mythology of the convention itself, a mythology that prevailed only because James Madison was a master political manipulator. He did his work well, both at the convention and through the state ratification conventions. But it was Washington's letter to Congress at the close of the convention which did more than anything else to move the conspiracy from a coup to a successful revolution. I regard this as the most significant letter in American history, the sequinon of the nation. Quote, We have now the honor to submit to the consideration of the United States in Congress assembled that constitution which has appeared to us the most advisable. The friends of our country have long seen and desired that the power of making war, peace, and treaties, that of levying money and regulating commerce, and the correspondent executive and judicial authority should be fully and effectually vested in the general government of the union but the impropriety of delegating such extensive trust to one body of men is evident hence results the necessity of a different organization it is obviously impractical in the federal government of these states to secure all rights of independent sovereignty to each and yet provide for the interest and safety of all individuals entering into society must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest The magnitude of the sacrifice must depend as well on situation and circumstance as on the object to be obtained. It is at all times difficult to draw with precision the line between those rights which must be surrendered and those which may be reserved, and on the present occasion this difficulty was increased by a difference among the several states as to their situation, extent, habits, and particular interests. In all our deliberations on this subject, we keep steadily in our view that which appears to us the greatest interest of every true American, the consolidation of our union, in which is involved our prosperity, felicity, safety, perhaps our national existence. This important consideration, seriously and deeply impressed on our minds, led each state in the convention to be less rigid on points of inferior magnitude than might have otherwise been expected. And thus the Constitution, which we now present, is the result of a spirit of amity and of that mutual deference and concession which the peculiarity of our political situation rendered indispensable. That it will meet the full and entire approbation of every state is not perhaps to be expected, but each will doubtless consider that had her interest been alone consulted, the consequences might have been particularly disagreeable or injurious to others, that is, liable to as few exceptions as could reasonably have been expected. We hope and believe that it may promote the lasting welfare of that country so dear to us all, and secure her freedom and happiness is our most ardent wish. End of quote.
Robert Rutland has reminded us of what the Anti-Federalists concluded after their defeat, and what James Monroe wrote to Jefferson in 1788. Quote, the prospect of Washington as president has ruined their chances, he told Jefferson. Be assured his influence carried the government, end of quote. The combination of two factors produced this revolution. One, the personal authority of George Washington. Two, the politically irresistible invocation of the invisible people as the new sovereign god of the nation. This new sovereign, announced the Constitution, would be represented in history by delegates to future state ratifying conventions rather than by elected representatives to existing state legislatures. This new doctrine of representation investiture was the central dogma of the Re revolution of 1787-88, from which the new nation subsequently derived its legitimacy. This dogma constituted both a theological and a political revolution. This revolution began with a coup, a conspiracy in Philadelphia. An update of my 1989 book. I published the bulk of this book as part three of my book, Political Polytheism, The Myth of Pluralism. It appeared in 1989. That book served as a 760-page appendix to my 1,287-page Tools of Dominion. The earlier sections of Political Polytheism dealt with covenant theology, the ethical system of Cornelius Van Til, Francis Schaeffer's defense of political pluralism, and the theory of the non-Christian nationhood of the United States, which was offered by a trio of Christian historians, Knoll, Hatch, and Marsden. The full book is available at www.freebooks.com. I have waited for over a decade for a detailed, documented critique of my thesis on the origins of the United States Constitution. There have been almost none. I regard only one critic as having done his homework on at least one aspect of my book's thesis, namely the Constitution's ban on religious test oaths. Dr. Dreibach takes the same position that Rush Juni did, namely that the framers wanted only to keep Congress from regulating religion. Dr. Dreibach, in a detailed and heavily footnoted article in the Baylor Law Review, failed to mention me or my book in his voluminous footnotes though he cited Rush Juni and Archie P. Jones, two Christian Reconstructionists, who promote his thesis. As his article shows, his thesis is of ancient vintage, stretching back to the 19th century. He argues that the Constitution's silence about God, although a radical break from Western political history, except for Rhode Island, which sent no delegates to the Constitution, was not based on secularism. It was merely an attempt by the members of the convention to keep Congress out of ecclesiastical matters. In my view, this argument has served as an anesthetic for Christians ever since 1787. The Unitarians and Freemasons who engineered the coup used similar arguments and sentiments to strip God out of the nation's founding covenantal document for the civil order. For all his footnotes, he nevertheless winds up providing lots of evidence for my book's original central thesis, namely that there is no neutrality and that any attempt to achieve it in covenantal affairs inevitably winds up favoring covenant breakers in their active pursuit of God-defying agendas. This is what happened to the Constitution, as I argued in 1989 and I argue here. The myth of neutrality is a myth, and every attempt to implement it judicially works to undermine the kingdom of God. Dr. Dryback seems almost surprised that a series of Supreme Court decisions after 1960 secularized the nations judicially. Gosh, all willikers, how did this happen, he seems to ask. In this book, as in political polytheism, I argue that this development was built into the original covenantal document. The Second American Revolution The Constitutional Convention did not take place in response to a democratic movement of the people, the voters in early 1787 were generally uninterested in national politics and were jealous of transfer of sovereignty to the central government. This outlook was not shared by the men who became the Constitution's framers and then retroactively the founders. As I shall show, what they did was illegal. It was far more illegal than what Daniel Shays did in Massachusetts, despite the fact that Shays' rebellion in 1786 and early 1787 was a major motivating factor in George Washington's last-minute decision to attend the convention. Without this decision, the convention would probably have failed. What is more, the framers knew that they were acting illegally. Shays' rebellion had provided an opportunity for a majority of a group of 55 men, more than half of whom were lawyers, to break the law of the land and get away with it. This is not how historians of the Constitution have treated the convention in Philadelphia. This fact provides additional support for the ancient rule of historiography. Indeed, its only known rule, the victors write the textbooks. 
The coup in Philadelphia became a revolution with the ratification of the Constitution. This transformed the legal order of the new nation. This was a second American revolution. Here I follow the analysis of legal historian Harold J. Berman, who speaks of a revolution as an event demonstrated retroactively to be a revolution, after it has transformed both the law and society for at least two generations. He identifies the American Revolution as one of six major revolutions in the history of the West, the Papal, beginning in 1076, the Protestant Reformation, 1517 through 55, the English Revolution, 1642 through 60, and then 89 through 88 through 89, the American Revolution, 1775 through 89, and the French Revolution, 1789 through 1815, and the Russian Revolution, 1917 through 53. Conclusion I can do no better than to end my preface by quoting the opening words of the preface to Forrest MacDonald's E Pluribus Unum, The Formation of the American Republic, 1776 through 1790. Quote, the first function of the founders of nations, after the founding itself, is to devise a set of true falsehoods about origins, a mythology that will make it desirable for nationals to continue to live under common authority, and indeed make it impossible for them to entertain contrary thoughts. End quote. The founders of the American Civil Order, whose work culminated with the ratification of the Constitution in 1788, lent their post-1788 authority to the creation of a grand mythology, as MacDonald outlines it. It was a mythology of American nationalism, as distinguished from American federalism. This is the grand mythology of the textbooks. The only historically significant challenge to this mythology took place on approximately 10,400 battlefields, from 1861 through 1865. But there was another aspect of this mythology. It has been so successful that Professor MacDonald and his contemporary academic peers, let alone the nationalist historians of the 19th century, do not consider it relevant, and hence rarely bother to mention it. The transformation of a dozen independent Christian civil commonwealths in 1775 into the covenantally agnostic civil order of 1788 that would, over the next two centuries, become covenantally atheistic. It is the story of the conquest of colonial America by Rhode Island, a victory that Rhode Island enjoyed without actually having participated in the struggle, the only colony not to send delegates to the convention, and the last of the 13 to ratify it just barely in 1790. It is this story that I have decided to tell one more time. The silence that greeted political polytheism indicates that once was not enough. Quoting the 1781 Articles of Confederation, Article 13, quote, Every state shall abide by the determination of the United States and Congress assembled on all questions which by this confederation are submitted to them. And the articles of this confederation shall be inviolably observed by every state, and the union shall be perpetual, nor shall any alteration at any time hereafter be made in any of them, unless such alteration be agreed to, to in a Congress of the United States, and be afterwards confirmed by the legislatures of every state. And whereas it hath pleased the great governor of the world to incline the hearts of the legislatures, we respectively represent in Congress to approve of and to authorize us to ratify the said Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union. Know ye that we, the undersigned delegates, by virtue of the power and authority to us given for that purpose, do by these presents in the name and in behalf of our respective constituents fully and entirely ratify and confirm each and every of the said Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, and all and singular the matters and things therein contained. And we do further solemnly plight and engage the faith of our respective constituents that they shall abide by the determinations of the United States in Congress assembled on all questions which by the said confederation are submitted to them, and that the articles thereof shall be inviolably observed by the states we rep respectively represent, and that the union shall be perpetual. End of quote. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ, our King. Subscribe now 
to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.